The following podcast is a Next Level production. I've been here before. Where memories turn on you. Even the good ones. More bad dreams. Maybe you should read something besides my journals if they're giving you nightmares. It's comforting to me actually reading your last words. It's nice. Panelists, welcome back to the show. I'm Steve. And I'm Daphne. And this is going to be a spoiler filled podcast of Snowpiercer Season 3, Episode 4, entitled Bound by One Track. Daphne, why don't you give us what our synopsis is? The synopsis for Bound by One Track is Alex finally deals with her parental figures as a track obstruction uncovers a painful past. <laughs> Ooh. Yes, and it was quite. Uh, so, what were your initial initial kind of thoughts for this episode? Well, I thought it was a great episode. It did make me a bit mad, which I'm going to get to later. In in a spot, um, I got a little bit irritated because, well, we're just going to talk about it later because I don't. It's one of my points. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, that's that's absolutely fine. I, I thought it was great as well, and there was, and like we already were talking about before we started recording, there was so much that was packed into this this episode that I just can't wait to to get into it. So uh, let's just let's just do that. Let's just get into it. All right. Well, before I tell you my point, I want to mention one thing. This episode was directed by Leslie Hope, who most people know as Terry Bauer. Uh, Jack Bauer's wife on 24. So she has gotten into directing. She has directed a few Snowpiercer episodes, and this is one of them. Wow. I didn't even notice that. As soon as you said Leslie Hope, I was searching my brain. I was like, I think that's for 24. And I was like, yes. sure enough. So, well, that's cool. That's, yeah. that's kind of cool and fun. To, to I was a huge, huge 24 fan back yeah, in the day. Yeah, me like, too. It was, it was, I had, it was funny because that was 2001. And they had to delay the beginning of it, you know, because of 9-11. Yeah. And I remember, though, I had my 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 VCR or my DVR or something I had set uh, to get before I actually got sent overseas. But I still had to catch up on on season one uh, when I came back from overseas. So it was it was. Uh, but yeah, I was a huge fan. I'm a huge Kiefer Sutherland fan and just loved it. And the huh, I'll, this is this is totally off topic, but. The last time I rewatched the the series, there's a moment, and I can't remember which season it was, and it's I have not been able to go back and watch anything more because I finally noticed that there's a scene where he's threatening a guy with with his gun, and you can clearly see, like they didn't even blur it out well. You can clearly see that there's a there's a cartridge like stove piped in the extractor, uh, in the pistols it extractor shoot and i was just like i can't i can't do this anymore that kind of mistake <laughs> is just oh and so i have not been able to go back and watch it since oh no are you afraid that you're just gonna be looking all the time for things like that now and it's ruined yeah, yeah. once i once i saw it i think i just i'm just gonna nitpick everything that i hear every time a glock cocks a hammer and all that kind of stuff so, <laughs> it's over no i i I may I may be able to go back and watch it again someday, but uh, just I I haven't recently. So, but I do have I have all of it on uh, DVD and Blu-ray. Or once yeah. they started doing Blu-rays, I think I got Blu-rays. But I've got all the way back to the first season on uh, on DVD. So it's hard to believe that show came out twenty like over twenty years ago. That's crazy, isn't it? That's it wild. is because it seemed so high tech at the time. Like yeah. it seemed like this really big thing. Yeah, and I'm a I'm a huge Marilyn Rice Cube fan as well. I follow her on Twitter and, and Instagram, and she's or is she on Instagram? I know she's on Twitter, but uh, yeah, she's she's amazing. She's a comedian, and she played uh, obviously she played 
Chloe. Chloe, thank you. I can't <laughs> believe the name was escaping me right there. But anyway, back to Snowpiercer. Okay. Uh, let's get into into our top five. You're late. You didn't invite me late. Like day is late. We could use you. Could you though? You stepped up as a leader. People will look to you if you let them. Hmm. <sighs> you know, when, when you were gone, we lost Mama Grande and both last Australians to the flu. I know. I'm sorry. And then you show up and we lose Strong Boy. Respect. May they rest. They don't, though, do they? <sighs> we have paid dearly, brother. But we are bringing the train back to land. All right, with my number five, I don't think you'd be so surprised. But I really pissed that they killed off the last Australians and Mama Grande, and we didn't see anything. They're just gone. No. I had this in my notes because we, I remember we specifically talked about it last week when they mentioned the influenza outbreak. And so, yeah, that was, oh, that was. Makes a, me a rough mad. One. Makes me really mad. And I want to know who else. If you're going to, if you've done this to us, tell us who else died. Do a flashback to the situation so we can see this because now I feel like. I didn't get any closure. I mean, Amelia and Murray, who were the last, last Australians, were just falling in love and every... Oh, no. Don't do this to me, Snowpiercer. I was not happy that they did that. And it really does make me question who else has died. We don't even know if Miles is still alive. We haven't seen him. Yeah, you're you're so much better at at remembering the characters than than I am that I don't know uh, who's missing who's missing and who we don't know and and stuff like that. So it'll be interesting to see as the rest of the season progresses what we find out if we're going to get more of these just quick aside lines of you know this person's gone because of this or are we actually going to get a flashback to that influenza outbreak? I don't know. So. I wish we would. I hope we do. I just kind of want to know. I'm so curious as to how it happened. And I have a theory on that that comes up in another point. Okay. Okay. Well, my first, my first one is really, it's, it's really pretty quick and, and it's, it's going to be more of it's going to be scattered throughout, but I, I laughed every time when I, I love the two Melanie's we have in this, in this episode, but there's, there's one moment with, with Ben and, um, uh, and Alex, when it's almost like at first I thought it was kind of creepy, and then and then I went, no, I think I think Ben is really trying to be like a father figure uh, to Alex. But there's there's that moment, you know, when Ben comes to the door and uh, the the <laughs> Mel uh, Alex's Melanie says uh, says, oh, I I sure do miss him. <laughs> and Alex just goes, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> too, much so... too much yeah, information. Too much information. I just thought it was hilarious. And then, uh, and then later, when uh, they, she he, Ben says something about that she didn't bring enough. She brought something to the to the train to make them spend the night, uh, and that they're trying to bond or something like that. And I was, I kind of, again, I kind of went to a creepy moment for a bit. But then I went, wait a minute, no, no, he's really. I think Ben is really trying to be. Like a father figure, he is. To, I think to so Alex too, because of his relationship with with Melanie, and I, it just makes it so much more. I I just I really liked what we saw here with the, the, like this. Not just talked about those parental things that we see, kind of, and I've got some more of it later when we talk about Alex some more. But I, I just loved seeing that those moments between her Mel, uh, Alex's Melanie, and Alex in the. Uh, in the train car and th that Melanie just being so nurturing and wanting to protect her. And that'll be kind of juxtaposed by Wilford, who I'll talk about in a, in a bit. Yes. On <laughs> but yeah, I just thought that was really, really great. Those, those kind of almost father daughter moments that Ben was trying to have with Alex. Yeah. I think everyone is not every character, but 
he's one that I think is really trying to step up and be kind of that person she can look up to. Because remember, she had Wilford to look up to. He was her, quote, father figure mm -hmm. for most of the time. And she learned a lot from him, which we did learn in this episode. It's really hard to reconcile with yourself when you look up to someone and you're raised one way and then you learn that things aren't completely what you thought they were. So she's probably got this battle going on in her head trying to figure out, well, how do I love this person who's so not what I thought he was? Mm -hmm. She, you know, as she goes. And it's funny because your point about ghosts kind of leads into my number four, which is ghosts and visions. And it's about facing demons in some way. Like Javi is brought back to the engine to drive. I don't think he's quite ready to, but he mm -hmm. pushes through it anyway. At first, when he comes in and he sits down and he puts his hula girl up, I'm thinking, oh, okay, all right, old Javi, we're, we're going to get him back. He probably won't be the same, but at least he's still in there. But then he's mm -hmm. haunted by these visions of Jupiter. Yeah, and the dog is getting, and it's getting closer and closer each time. Yes. And then we also, as you said, have Melanie, who is, I don't know what she is, a vision, a ghost, appearing to Alex. And then you see her also appearing with Wilford. And we'll get into that a little bit more when we're talking about those characters more. But in addition to those, we also have Asha, who's dealing with her own demons and ghosts. Because we keep getting these flashes of what's in her head. It was so great to see her, you know, take a drink and start to dance and look like she was letting herself go a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then those things crept back in and she had to leave and went, went into the, the what I call the dream room um, <laughs> yeah. to hang out. And then Till goes to get her. I feel like... Till spent a lot of time looking out for people in this episode. So, yeah, but I, I think, you know, people are dealing with their own ghosts, visions, demons during this episode. And as we'll talk about in a little bit, there's a lot of deep trauma that's going on for them. Yeah, I like that you brought this up because I had Asha's PTSD in there and the trauma that, that what we see is that her her isolation is the trauma of her isolation is coming out in these moments when she's surrounded, suddenly surrounded by all these people and people are talking to her and talking at her. And, and then, she, like you said, she rushes off and we get another one of those flashbacks of her fighting someone and that blood on the wall, like you talked about last week that the blood looks more fresh than what it should be if the altercation took place years and years ago. She's yeah. actually been alone there for four years. And that also explains kind of why she just attacks Leighton like right out of the blue, like doesn't, didn't even take a moment to find out who he is or what he's doing there. She just straight up attacked him. Yeah. It, it makes me wonder is she fighting out of fear because that's what she had to do? Is it a defense mechanism? Or is she fighting because she, you know, is the queen of the roost and she, the queen of the world and she has to maintain that position? Mm -hmm. And something I noticed too about one of her flashbacks, it shows the blood on the wall and then a person collapsed down and I wonder if someone shot themselves. Like, that is what I took from that. Oh, Potentially that, that that could be something. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely more to the story as we've yeah. talked about. So. There's a lot. Yeah, there's definitely a lot to talk about with her. There's a lot we haven't seen yet. And I'm interested. I don't trust her 100% right now. I'm glad that the they brought her along because it's helping Leighton, but... 
I don't know. I don't trust yeah. her. I don't. The only the only thing I trust is that I believe she's going to keep the lie as long as she can. She she yes. as long as she can maintain her composure and and keep that lie, I think she's going to. Now, is there going to be a moment maybe when she's going to break down so much and reveal something or is someone's interrogation going to be just too much for her at some point? We'll see. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for uh, sure. I like, I like that you brought up that Till was, was really helping. We saw her with Asha, but she did a lot with Roche in this episode. And I really, I just, I love the, the character of Till so much because we, we heard her talk about Roche last episode in this very endearing way. And that she wanted to get him out of the drawers and then she gets him out of the drawers and she sees what he's going through. And, you know, she's the one that pulls him off the couch. And uh, who was it? Uh, was it Miss Audrey who said, who told him, you know, get him out of there. He's just stinking up my couch, you know. Um, um no, that was then... our new, our uh, new queen of the night car sent okay. him along okay. with that. Okay, yes. that's who that was. Okay. Yeah. So we didn't see Miss Audrey this episode then. No, we did not see I, her in this episode at all. No, okay. that was LJ. Okay, that's yeah. right. You're right, it was LJ. And we also haven't seen Josie in a while. So No, I two, miss Josie. Two characters, two characters to catch up with. But I, I love that whole thing with, with Roche and Till where she's she's trying to help him out. And it was a little jarring to me because there's a, I don't know if it was the way that the scene was edited or or what but like we see her take Roche to the spot where his his wife died and he sh and she shows him the drawer and he asks to be alone and at first when he went to get the drugs out of the refrigerator i thought it was because because remember they alluded to a very addictive quality of this stuff in the first season. Yes. And I thought maybe that was what he was getting it for because he was addicted to it. But on the second watch, I realized I shouldn't have thought that because all he got was one syringe and one, and one bag. If he was really an addict, he would have taken as much as he could. But the way they edited the scene, she leaves him alone and he gets the drugs. He puts it in his pocket and then immediately we, we cut to till at the night car drinking and I'm like, what, what, wait, did I miss something? Did, <laughs> how much time has passed? What's, did she just leave him alone and go, okay, buddy, I'm going to go, you know, cause I was really afraid during the, that whole thing with the drug that I thought maybe he was going to kill himself. He's, you know, he's touching the pictures I of his family. I thought that too. I thought he got all dressed up and I thought, oh no, he's going to try to like send himself into some sort of permanent suspension. Mm -hmm. And there is also, remember, it was Henry Klimt, another character, the doctor who used to put people mm -hmm. in the drawers that we haven't seen, another no. name for that list. He used to sell samples of the suspension mm -hmm. liquid. I thought, I thought I remembered something about that, that the, the first season or the second season, there was, it was a very addictive quality to that. And they kind of put that story to the side, I think, or maybe they just felt it was too much and... Yeah, it had to do I'm with not... the chronol, I guess, was the yeah. kind of the drug that people would make from that. Yeah. Yeah, they would make it from that, yeah. When he goes into that car and he plunges that needle into into Wilford's, like the first time, the first watch through, I was just, I was so totally shocked when, when he plunges that needle in Wilford's chest and Wilford's like, you stabbed me in the heart with it. Uh, that's yeah. Really <laughs> <laughs> yeah I did, but I heart. was honestly happy. Uh -huh. I was happy about it because honestly, he's just been so diabolical this whole time that you can't trust him and he's too charming to leave alive. Put him in the drawer at least. Put him in the drawers because he is too, it's too tempting for someone. He could talk to the right person or the wrong person and end up getting away. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how he, you know, because he's still in a coma or, you know, I think Leighton said he's going to recover, but he's he's got a long ways to go or something like yeah. that. And of course, we have that scene there at the end with Alex at the bedside and, and her vision of Melanie. 
standing over him and, and she says something like he's not so big from this perspective. I thought that was, I thought was great. We saw Alex grow so much Definitely. in this episode from beginning to the end that I think it's, it's going to be really cool to see. And Rowan Blanchard just played it so well. Yeah. She's wonderful. Yeah. I actually had that quote written down in my quotes for today. He's not so powerful when you put him into perspective, is he? And I like that. Yeah, I, I do. I, like I, I agree with you. I think Alex did grow. She had a lot. She had to go through a lot in this episode. There were mm -hmm. a, a lot of demons and you know, the past can come back to haunt you or it can help you. And that actually leads to my next point, which is past coming back to haunt or help you. <laughs> um, we had a few instances of that with Pike is trying to face his past as a criminal, mm -hmm. which I think he's a criminal. Leighton's aware of his past deeds, the things he used to do, and he doesn't really seem interested, though, in sharing what he did in his past with Ruth, because I think he wants Ruth to continue to see the best in him, because they're all supposed to be starting to select vocations for their new life once they get off the train, or mm -hmm. whenever they kind of transition to the new life. And so we have that as one piece of it. But then we also have Wilford's past deeds coming back to not necessarily bite him, but bite the rest of the folks on Snowpiercer because we come upon these three cars that are blocking the road and they're clamped down so they can't just be pushed out of the way. And that's where we really start to learn part of a story that Alex alluded to last season when she told Ruth about Wilford culling half the population on Big Alice. Mm -hmm. And that was when Wilford was starting to take a tense, uh, census on Snowpiercer last year. Alex told them about this, about this situation. Right. And we're really getting to see it now. Yeah. But this sort yeah. of thing, this culling that he did makes me wonder a little bit if maybe he had the, the doctor's head would create some sort of a virus that ended up taking out half, you know, a bunch of people on Snowpiercer. I mean, it very well could oh. just have been the flu, but I don't put a lot past him, especially when we actually got to see this. And Alex broke down exactly what happened. They tested people for their stamina and physical strength. Mm -hmm. They He ranked them all by their skill set. He used the book club to find original thinkers. I thought that was a, that was so good when I heard that the first time at the book club. And I thought about our book club. And I, was I like, know. <laughs> <laughs> You know, he, he, he did all of this. He deemed those people the essentials and it didn't matter that families and couples, he separated them, mm -hmm. you know, and he made people feel like they were chosen and she felt like she was chosen. However, we got to learn a little bit about why Alex wanted to go so badly onto those cars. And it's because she left behind a friend that she had when she was 10 years old. Because when Wilfred did this, it was in year one, Alex was only 10 years old. That's This is a lot for a little girl to go through. Mm -hmm. And she had to go back and face this tragedy because the first car they enter is there's nothing really in there. But when they enter, I think it's car two, and they start seeing the beds. She didn't want Ben to go because she didn't want Ben to see what Wilfred actually did. I don't think she wanted him to know how really, truly wretched Wilfred is. To like, yeah. in, the only kind thing that he did in that situation is they were all asleep when it happened. Mm -hmm. So they didn't expect it. 
I had this, I had some of this in my notes as well, because this goes back to also Wilford, because one of the things we realize in this is that Wilford knows these tracks so well. You know, he's making that cave drawing on the wall, trying to figure out where they are. And it's, and once they stopped, he realizes, oh, I know where we are. And he knew they were there at the culling. And the first time through, I, I thought he was genuinely remorseful but I realized on the second watch, he wasn't remorseful about what he did. He was remorseful that Alex was going to have to go in there mm-hmm. and see it. Now, he did remember Shiloh's name. Yes, so- I thought that was interesting. He's very clever. I feel like he remembers what he has to. So he mm-hmm. did remember Shiloh's name. I mean, what harm would it have been to take that little girl to you? Why did he... He's just so... Ugh. He's a demon. It's so terrible the way that he is. But this also turned out to be a situation where Alex was helped because Wilfred spent a lot of time with her. He started at the age of 10 with her as far as her becoming an engineer. And he basically, they flash to another piece where Wilfred is showing Alex to be an engineer, one has to learn to see beyond the surface of things. Look beyond the walls and floor, see the arteries running through the train, engines pulse. You see the lungs, now let them breathe. And this helps Alex because as she's going through the cars, it's almost like she's retracing steps. She's able to find that leak in the hydraulics to get those connections off the track because she notices a change in the frost pattern. And it's interesting because we're thinking this is going on at the same time that Roche is heading with the needle to Wilfred. And we're thinking, oh, if he hurts Wilfred, we're not going to have, you know, they'll never get out. This is another instance where the writers, they shift you and make you think one thing and then they completely show you that not any one person knows everything. Yeah. And I like I, that. I, I love this moment in, in there between her and her Melanie, when she's figuring out the hydraulic leak, cause they realize that, that Wilford's not going to be able to do it. And she starts to break down and she says she can't, but then, and Jennifer, another one of these, I, Jennifer Connelly. So good. I know. I loved when she's talking. I have this in, in my notes. It's it's, she says to Alex, when Alex is just breaking down, she says, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay to miss him and to hate him. It's even okay to love him. Getting choked up. (laughs) I ran from him and I became him. Yes. And I don't have the whole rest of the quote because there's there's more to it. But it's just so... I have the rest of it. Go ahead. Face him. Face all of the things that haunt you. It will set you free. Yeah. That connection, though, that, you know, her mom, I mean, we really, I mean, we don't know Melanie's fate, although maybe we do and we just don't want to accept it, but getting her back for this episode was such a gift because we got to see her interactions with Alex in this motherly way. And I know that when, when they first connected, when Wilford first showed up with Alex, and Melanie realized her daughter was alive. They butted heads a lot. They they just had these experiences that were were difficult. And mm-hmm. when Melanie left the last time to go up and get the data, they were just starting to get along. Now I feel like if Melanie came whistling down the hill on, on a snowmobile, Alex would be running to greet her. Because Alex has had some time to learn more about her mother, I think, from the others. And I I think it's helped their bond. And I love that we got this episode with them connecting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, uh, I'm so, I, I know I think I said it every week, I'm so torn about watching this episode kind of made me think, well, maybe she's alive and that's going to be the big the big reveal because they're going to have all these moments and then she, but 
maybe she's going to be alive and maybe her character has changed. Mm hmm. You know, from being alone for however long is it's been six months. It's been six or, months. Yeah. So she's going to have that trauma if she's alive or they're going to find her dead. And that's going to be the confirmation. So I, I don't I don't know. I'm just uh, I'm excited. Uh, yeah, me too. I'm just glad that we got this little little bit because I feel like it added so much to the mm -hmm. depths of their relationship. It just, it really did mean a lot. So, so I have no idea where we're at. Um, but my, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I may, I may just leave it in. It's fine. It's fine to not know where we're at. Um, I want to talk about Leighton and Zara for, for a minute. Leighton, Leighton finds out from, uh, Dr. Hedwig, uh, no, from, not from Dr. Hedwig, from, the doctor who was the army, the, the military doctor. Yes. That she was not involved in Zara's pregnancy and that it was all Dr. Hedwig's. And he looks, starts looking at the chart and realizes that she's been experimenting on his baby, their, their baby. And he assumes, he just assumes it's without Zara's permission. And he goes off on the doctor before the doctor finally stops him. I don't think we've ever seen him so mad. Oh no! He was so theory. mad. He was throwing things at her. Oh my gosh! Uh, I was scared for her for a minute there, and then when she reveals that no, that she had permission, then he goes and he turns on Zara, and they have this this. Yeah, Doctor Headwood says to him, "You need to go talk to Zara about this." And I'm like, "Oh my god! She she consented. What is going to happen?" Mm -hmm. And he finds out they're doing the same things to his baby that they were doing to Josie yes. to make her resistant to the cold. And so I'm a little concerned about what happens if they stop doing this, these experiments. Does, is that going to harm the baby? Or if they continue doing it, is that going to harm the baby? But that last scene, as I, as I was watching it just before we recorded, he does come back to their car and we don't hear what the conversation is but she just lets him back in the room and then we cut we cut away back to Alex so I, I'm going to be interested next next week to see kind of where their relationship is at and of course you know we have this love triangle that like we mentioned before we haven't seen Josie in a while but there's still a love triangle there of him and Josie and him and Zara yes so, uh, I'm just I'm just interested again to see where that's where that's going to lead us to. I think Zara had said to him, "You've got to make a choice. You, the anger, dealing with Headwoods, all of this stuff. You've got to make a choice." And I think him coming back was him coming back to her. But yeah. I do think he does love Josie. I don't think that he just all of a sudden stopped loving her. I think. You know, Zara's having his child and this is where his focus is right now. But, you know, we'll see soon enough, I think, because I mm -hmm. think that baby is not long from coming. That's from what we saw. Yeah. We'll, and we'll talk about the preview after we get done with the episode. But uh, yeah. So that's uh, that's where we're at. Uh, we're up to your next one. All right. Well, my next one is we can't get through this episode without talking about Ruth and Pike in their little relationship. <laughs> I think Ruth always wants to see the best in people. And I think about when we first met her and how stern she was and what a rule follower she was. But now we're seeing her. She's going to get a jacket so that she can go back to work so she can do her role again. She's going right back to hospitality. Mm-hmm. And Pike wants her to have, you know, what was it? Banana, some banana Bananas thing. Bananas Foster. Bananas, Bananas Foster. Foster. He promised her that they could have Bananas Foster. So he brought the banana. They were going to, he wanted her to do it. Well, he talks her into it. Mm -hmm. So they're spending some time together. And, you know, she sees good in him because he stepped up to be a leader and be her right hand guy. And she wants to see him continue to do things like that. Mm -hmm. And Leighton even saw it as well. I mean, he keeps telling you, 
You stand up as a leader and people will look up to you if you would let them. So even though Leighton knows his past, he still believes Pike could be a leader for Snowpiercer if he would just get out of his own way. Mm-hmm. And I was also taken aback by, I mean, Ruth looked truly beautiful in this episode. She looked at peace. She just looked wonderful. And I loved when she called Pike Mr. Metrosexual. <laughs> when he took her to this little place called, that I think she called it a Pierre de Terre. And yeah. that is French for foot on the ground. And it's basically, I went and looked it up, a small living unit apartment located in a large city some distance away from an individual's primary residence. So it makes sense. It's, it just looked like a curtain. You move mm-hmm. the curtain and go in. But Ruth... <laughs> Finally, Ruth and Pike, they they kiss. I love the way they filmed that. It was like them. Oh, it was so beautiful. The filters they used in the haze and that whatever that stained glass in the background. Yeah. In the background was just wonderfully yeah, wonderfully beautiful. It was lovely. And when it's all over, because they do get down to business. <laughs> She wants to know why he has an aversion to p- a potential, but he doesn't really ever answer that. Mm-hmm. But he does say to her at one point, the best version of me is already gone. My right hand to your rebel commander, you should be taking, you should be leading this train, not Leighton. So he loved being like assistant rebel commander with Ruth. He would do yeah. whatever she wanted. And she just wants him to step up to be who he can be and not get stuck in the past. And mm-hmm. he can't get himself out of feeling like he's stuck in the past. Like he ha- he she... keeps going back to, I've done all these things I can't change. She, she wants him to change and I feel like he can, but I don't know if he will. I don't know if their relationship will last even because at the end she's just kind of leaving and he's not getting up to kiss her goodbye or anything. It was just kind of like, okay, so is this how we're going to leave this? Yeah. All right. I was, I, I was puzzled by that too, because, you know, he, he says that line about you should be leading the train and she says you shouldn't be saying things like that uh, because she, you know, she still sees Leighton as as the leader as and she's as she always has even when she was leading in i think in her mind she was preparing for Leighton to return yes you know i don't think she ever thought of herself as the permanent leader so we're gonna see but yeah i, I was a little her kind of leaving and that that and he's just laying there in the bed and i'm like well okay i guess they took care of business and now they're gonna move on yeah but, uh, but she's I, like I i'm know. not late I, to work I'm not late to work yet. Yeah. So I, 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 I'm again, I'm torn about this, this couple because I, I want to see them go forward. Cause it's such a, it's such an odd couple, you know, the, the two of them that it would be cool to see how, how they would navigate that relationship yeah. on the train. Cause it is um, odd. They are an odd match. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's going to be fun going forward to see how this, how this relationship progresses. Yeah. Um, let's see. What else did I have here? We talked about Javi already. Um, um, yeah, I mean, a lot of my stuff that we've talked, we've kind of talked through, um, just looking to see if I have anything else here that I haven't, uh, there was a, okay. This is just, this is more of a programming note than a really a story note, but my, I DVR'd it and I don't know if this was your experience watching it live, but at the end, towards the end there, when Roche plunges the needle into Wilford, the, the screen went to black, like it was going to go to a commercial. And then it immediately goes to the next scene It on my, Ooh, my DVR. I'll have to check it, that and see if it, that's what it did. It goes to black, immediately goes to the next scene, which is till in, in the, uh, in the room there with Leighton and Wilford and Roche and right at the moment where 
Leighton tells Till to to get Roche out of there. Then it went to commercial, like abruptly went to commercial on my DVR. And I'm like, huh. this is so confusing. I had to back it up and watch it a couple times just to figure out what's going on here. What's happening. So I'm not sure if that was a weird programming thing from TNT. I will or, have to check that. Uh, but yeah, it was, yeah. it was weird. So I'm going to have to watch it again when I can watch it like uh, on a streaming service where I don't have commercials in it. So that's, that's to my see plan what happens to, yeah. tonight to actually see it all cut correctly together. You know, but that's that's true. There was a little little weird editing moment there, a programming moment there. Yeah. Well, my last thing is basically Roche. Because I we've talked about this already. I mean, I didn't know. Are you going to try to kill yourself? Are you going to kill somebody? Are you going to get mm -hmm. high? What what are you doing? And we got to see that. Mm hmm. We saw interactions with his daughter, Carly, and he's just not there for his daughter mm -hmm. at all. And she's resentful of it. So I went back and said, why, you know, we talked a little bit last week. Why was he in the drawers in the first place? Mm -hmm. And so I went back and did a little bit of rewatch of a couple of scenes and some investigation. And I'm not sure Roche even knew he was going to the drawers. I think Wilford sent him there, but never, I don't think he knew that he was going. Okay. Because on the show, he left this conversation he had with Leighton. He was just talking to him and telling him, you know, I'll do what I can to take care of the tailies. And then the next thing we knew, he was in the drawers. Okay. So we don't have a clear through mm -mm. line. Okay. Yeah. No. That's I, I thought the interactions with his daughter was, was really interesting because she says something like, you know, this is happening to me too. Yes. And he's, he's basically not, you know, it's, it's all, and it's, you know, you go through this as when you're a couple, when you lose family members, you, you go through this and each person, I mean, I've lost, I've lost my mom, my dad and a sister in well, I lost my mom and my sister in the span of a couple of years. So it was, and it's we rough. all went through it. And it was, it was one of my brothers was not able to travel to my dad's funeral. And so we made it a point as a family to try to stick together. Mm -hmm. And so, so seeing this really troubled me because I hated seeing him just ignoring his daughter and not to, because you're the father. I know you're hurting. You've lost your wife, but you still have a daughter you need to take care of. And that's yeah. your responsibility, man. Well, remember, so. they lost other children, too. Like, mm -hmm. he and oh, his wife right. lost other kids as well. So this, right. you know, they've been a trio for quite a while. And his wife begged him to be loyal to Wilfred, and he would not. Like, he could not mm -hmm. be loyal to Wilfred. He chose the other side. And I think Wilfred probably decided, well, you're going to the drawers, because I can't trust you. Mm -hmm. um, it's really sad it was sad to see the situation but also i think it was somewhat realistic if you think about people like you said people all deal with things differently and sometimes in this like in this situation when you're blaming yourself for what happened you can't get out of your own head and you're so mm -hmm. focused on yourself knowing also feeling bad that you're not being there for your daughter i have no doubt that he's got all this going on in his head until he just decides well you know what for me and for my daughter i'm going to take i'm going to take him out because yeah. then if anything happens to me okay but at least i know that man is not going to be alive and allowed to hurt my child again but as we saw, he's like a, <laughs> like a phoenix, <laughs> <laughs> right? I just, you know, I just think back to when they had, what was it, the carnival, and he's acting mm -hmm. like a ringmaster, and I'm just thinking, oh, does anything take him out? I don't know. Yeah. I really believe that they should put him in the drawers. I don't think he should be awake and able to talk to anyone. 
Yeah, I don't know. It's it's gonna be interesting story wise to see if they if they take that route or how long he's kind of if he's in a coma or whatever kind of whatever state he's in. If yeah. they, they can put him in the drawers, we'll have to see. So yeah. Um, did you have any other notes? The only other thing that I have is that I didn't mention when we were talking about this earlier is Zara's decision to go through with the genetic therapy. Mm -hmm. You know, Leighton really says to her, you stamped the baby with Wilfred so you could use it to protect yourself. Mm -hmm. And so he is actually accusing her of doing this to save her own butt and not really doing it for the baby. And which I think goes back to the fact that even though they're having a baby, he doesn't trust her as much as he would like to. And it's because they were together mm -hmm. originally. And then she left to go to the front of the train. And there's a huge breach of trust between the two of them. And this was just kind of putting a magnifying glass on it again or a spotlight on it again. Well, and that's what she says. You know, she says the reason she, she did it was because you want to take her off the train. And she knows the only way to survive off the train is this is going to be this treatment. So she doesn't trust that his new Eden exists. Yeah. There's a so lot it, of, there's a lot. They have a lot of baggage to dig through. They got trust, I think. They got they, trust issues. They got sure. trust issues. They got some problems. They have a lot that they have to work out the only other thing that i had too and i just realized is getting to see a 10 year old alex with her friend shiloh and the things that they would do like listening to that cd which basically said before on it and it's birds tweeting and the ocean and that's what alex took with her when she went onto mm -hmm. the train it was just sad and happy at the same time to see her do that and like you said and we've talked about she really grew in this episode we mm -hmm. got to yeah we got to see her grow uh the only other note i had was and i i probably knew this before but i had to look it up i didn't realize that mutton is sheep yeah so they have sheep on the on the train so they, some, they might still have or they have somewhere. sheep meat. They have sheep yeah. meat on somewhere, at least. Yeah, there's somewhere. Um, any quotes? No, we've already said them. We've um, already the did only them. One, the only one I've got that I don't think we've said yet is the one I put in the dock. And that was when they're on the, the train and Javi realizes that Alex, what's about the bodies and he says i'm already relying on one fragile engineer now i have to worry about two and that's when she comes back with no you don't have to worry about me and uh, and all that but i i loved that he kept calling her engineer he kept mm -hmm. saying engineer engineer because he's he's trying to build her up to be what her mom was which was one of the greatest engineers and we saw that you know melanie would, would just she could just touch the train and she knew what was happening. Mm -hmm. We saw that in season one when she knew the track was, when she told everybody to brace. And so I, I just, I just love that he's, he's keeping her focused and uh, on task this, this whole time. Again, it just goes back to that idea of he's trying to be kind of a father figure to her. Yeah. I think too, she's got Melanie's gift. She learned a lot from Wilford. A lot from Wilford. We got to see some of that in this episode. We really got to see her shine. We got to mm -hmm. see her step up and do the brave things. I mean, she wanted to go there alone. But Ben wasn't having yeah. any of that, so. No. <laughs> it's a two-engineer job. You know that. Yep. So. so, yeah. So, that is all I have. I've got nothing else. I did not see any uh, feedback. I, I checked uh, email. Um, I did not get a chance to check Instagram, but I didn't see anything earlier today on the gram, as the kids All are saying right. nowadays. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I guess we go right into, do you have any podcast recommendations? I do not this week because as you know, I've been really busy with podcasting and some stuff with the Olympics. So I haven't had a chance to listen to much. And when I do, it's usually the book that we're doing for book club, which is Salem's Lot. Yeah, I have not had anything extra. I 
that I'm listening to either really I'm I've already mentioned uh, the ones that I'm that I'm following. I, I'm, I would just uh, continue to to recommend Strange Indeed on Podcastica. They are, mm-hmm. they are into whatever season of you it is now. It escapes me. It's season three, three. season three of you. So I, I encourage yeah. everybody if you like that show and uh, you want to hear a good podcast on it, Pake and Rima, I'm sure are doing a wonderful job covering you. Yeah, they are. I have not seen the show, so I can't listen to it, but I'm sure they're doing a great job. They always do. So as we do every week, we encourage you to listen to us on your podcast player of choice. We are available on Spotify, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, or again, whatever podcast player you use. If there's a rating available on there, we would love to get a a big five stars or a thumbs up or whatever you could do to to rate us. And we will definitely uh, shout you out for that. Yeah, you can check out our new website at panels to pixels podcast.com. You can submit feedback to us on Facebook, which is just facebook.com slash panels to pixels. We are on Twitter at panels to pixels. That's panels with the number two and then pixels. We have an email address, which is panels to pixels one at gmail.com. That's panels to pixels one, the TO is spelled out right in the middle, and the number one at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, which is where I listen to a lot of my podcasts sometimes. And all you have to do is search Panels to Pixels podcast and give us a thumbs up for our episodes. We are also on the gram, as I mentioned earlier, at Panels to Pixels podcast, all spelled out in letters, Panels to Pixels podcast. Check out all the other podcasts on the Next Level Podcast Network. We highly recommend them. Wilhelm, The Melting Pat, Podcast Zero, and so much more. Go to nextlevelradioonline.com and check out all of them over there. Coming up next week, we will have the fifth episode of Snowpiercer Season 3 entitled A New Life. <gasps> I think I know what that refers to. Oh. I really, I do. Oh. Did you watch the preview? Yeah. I did. I, I, I vaguely watched it. Uh, <laughs> I know it looks like Zara's going to go into labor and there's going to be some trouble. Yes. And yes. there was somebody making out at the end. I didn't catch which the two characters were, though. I know. It's a blessed event, I think, is coming. Mm-hmm. The new life. That could be the new life. I'm not sure, though. So we'll see. I mean, they could just... Who knows with this show where they're going to end up by the end of the next episode. What's coming up <laughs> for you, Daphne? Okay, so this week we are releasing an episode of Run For Your Lives that will have our friend Des on. We talked about James Gunn's 2006 creepy movie called Slither, and it's pretty it's pretty good. I think I saw that. I don't remember. Is it Nathan Fillion? Yes. Okay. I, I have seen that one then, so very good. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. We had... A great time with Des. It's the first time he's been on the podcast, so it was a lot of fun to get to ch- uh, chat with him and cover the movie. So, yeah, that will be out this Friday. Very exciting. Very exciting. Um, for me, you can hear me right here on Panels to Pixels. Laura and I will continue our coverage of The Witcher Season 2. Uh, it's it's getting good. It's, it's getting exciting. Uh, we are now into the part that uh, Laura has not seen yet. She had while we watched the first four episodes before we started podcasting on it and so the last four uh, she's clueless about all right i put you on the same playing field yes <laughs> well with that we want to wish everyone a good night i'm steve i'm daphne and this has been panels to pixels and we will see you on the next panel good night good night